I am the bread of life. Uh, from John the sixth chapter, but to get a background, as we get into John 6, Jesus feeds a multitude of people. It consists of 5,000 men. Some have put a possible total of 20,000 people as a result. We don't really know, but it does state 5,000 men. He did so with five loaves and two small fishes. They are going to come and take him by force almost and, take, and make him to be a king. But he is going to refuse that because his kingdom is not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom. And so he goes and departs to the other side of the Sea of Capernaum. The next day, here's this multitude of people wondering where he is. And so they finally travel across the sea as well. And they find Jesus. Jesus recognizes the fact, though, that the only reason they're seeking him is, and I'll put it this way, they got their bellies full. It states in verse 26 that Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, seek, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. That's the reason Jesus states, you're seeking me. Upon this rebuke, though, Jesus now begins a lesson on the bread of life, as opposed to the manna that Moses had given them. And in the midst of this lesson thus, Jesus refers to himself as, in verse 35, I am the bread of life. And he says, He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He repeat, repeats the statement in verse 48, I am that bread of life. And so our lesson this morning deals with some lessons that we can learn from this statement. And first, we want to learn what it is not. Because... Invariably, when you talk about Jesus' statement about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, some individuals are going to immediately think of the Lord's Supper. It's a lot like that song that uh, is oftentimes led before the Lord's Supper, Break Thou the Bread of Life, that has really nothing to do with the Lord's Supper but it's sung because people automatically associate that phrase with the Lord's Supper when it doesn't talk about that. Well, Jesus is not talking about the Lord's Supper in this context. One individual, after talking about the context of this, says, well, didn't Jesus in his words teach about the Lord's Supper? Thus, it talks about the Lord's Supper. Well, taking that kind of uh, approach, this is talking about baptism. <laughs> it would be about the same thing. Nor is he talking about cannibalism. Uh, although we will come back to this in a little bit, but that's not what he is talking about, actual cannibalism. It would be in, Jesus' teaching would be in opposed to that. But now then knowing and just briefly touching those two aspects of what it's not, it is a statement of deity. And I would recommend Brother Jerry Brewer's lesson yesterday on the Alpha and Omega, a great lesson dealing with the fact of Jesus' deity. And that I am statement going back is... To Exodus 3 and verses 13 and verse 14. When Moses is being commissioned by God to go into Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he says, well, when I go, then the children of Israel are going to ask me, who sent me? 
And God says, tell them I am that I am. And thus I shall say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Well, when Jesus uses these I am statements, it is an immediate reference back to that which every Jew would recognize in relationship to that one that sent Moses to them. I am that I am. It also associates its himself with the term Yahweh or Jehovah, however one wishes to pronounce it. The idea of that term was an ongoing being or sometimes used existing one. He is the existing one. That's the idea of Jehovah. That's the idea of I am. He is continually existing, the one who always is. And so we would recognize the aspect that Jesus is literally God. John 1 and verse 1, uh, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And we find in verse 14 that that Word became flesh. Jesus of Nazareth is that one who is, as Matthew records in Matthew 1, verse 23, God with us. And so he is God. And this is a, a clear, very pointed statement in relationship to his deity. It, it amazes me at times that the modernist will sometimes claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, that is foolishness when you look at all of the statements. And in the 8th chapter of John, when he says that he is, before Abraham was, I am, they took up stones. Why? Because they recognized what he was saying. They recognize he's claiming to be God. Even though these, you know, 1900, 2000 years later, idiots cannot understand that. He is God. But also, when he talks about being the bread of life, we're dealing with the proper nourishment that is needed. There's an old statement that we have in relationship to what we eat today, that one is what they eat. No doubt that's true from a physical standpoint. And we see it a lot of times with all of the junk food that uh, young people eat and some of us old people eat, and we start showing it around the waistline and all of that because we are what we eat from a physical standpoint. That's also true from a spiritual standpoint, though. We are what we eat from a spiritual standpoint. Now, Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. One thing that bread indicates here is the aspect of food. There is something which we are to partake of. It also implies a hunger. Now Jesus is making a contrast, yes, between the physical and the spiritual. From a physical standpoint, we recognize the need for physical food in order to sustain life. We would see that from a spiritual standpoint as well. There is the need for the spiritual nourishment the bread of life, in order to sustain life from a spiritual standpoint. In the Old Testament, and Jesus references the aspect that Moses gave to the Israelites manna to keep them alive physically. When these people, the thousands of people who sought Jesus after the feeding that they received. And Jesus says, you, saw, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. 
He then adds, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that which is endureth to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Verse 26 and 27 of our text. Don't worry so much about the physical. You need to be concerned with the spiritual. That's the opposite of what these individuals that were seeking Jesus were seeking Him for. They wanted the physical food. That's all they were concerned with. Let me get my belly full and I'm going to be satisfied. And Jesus is saying, don't worry about that. Don't labor for that. You need to be concerned with the spiritual aspect. That meat that will not perish, that meat that will endure to everlasting life. There is that aspect thus of this bread of life that's going to endure to everlasting life. In the Beatitudes, in Matthew, the fifth chapter, in verse 6, Jesus says, Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, there's a great parallel in relationship to what Jesus says in that case and what we're seeing in relationship to this. You need to have a strong desire for spiritual matters, for the church, for righteousness, for God's Word. And as you read John the sixth chapter, that's what Jesus is dealing with, His words, and we'll deal with that a little bit more in just a moment. And by the way, I would recommend highly a certain chapter in the lectureship book from Bellevue on the Beatitudes that dealt with that Beatitude in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. It happened to be written by a fellow named uh, David P. Brown. It is an excellent lesson. Because he indicates in that about the desire that is there. When you have the proper desire for spiritual matters, then you're going to be filled. The problem is so many times that we don't have that proper desire for the spiritual matters. We allow the physical to take precedence over the spiritual. Peter expresses it in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Here is that which is of true importance that which we are to have a desire for. You withhold food from a baby for very long and you're going to hear about it. And you're going to continue to hear about it until that baby starts getting the food. Now we all know that. That's a very basic principle because there is that innate desire to feed physically. That's the same type of desire that we as individuals should have for God's Word from that spiritual aspect. But not only does it imply that hungering and thirsting after righteousness, there's also implied in this the proper nourishment. And that goes back to what we, that we are, what we eat, both physically and spiritually speaking. The problem in the Lord's church today, and basically religion today, is that so many people eat junk food, spiritually speaking. Now, we get away from the physical aspect of it for now. We eat junk food spiritually. Try and have a bookstore that deals with true matters of spirituality today. See how far it gets you until you have to start because of the demand for fluff and nothingness in books like the Max Lucado 
books and all of these others likened to that that have and consist of absolutely nothing spiritually speaking. It makes people feel good, but it's not going to feed them spiritually. They're feeding on junk food from a spiritual standpoint. We start listening to the philosophies of men from a spiritual standpoint, and what does it do? It avails us absolutely nothing. It has no value for us. How many false doctrines are there, not only in the religious world, but have made their way into the Lord's church? Why? Because brethren have filled their lives with fluff and nothingness and have no spiritual background in relationship to teaching and, error, and recognizing error. Teaching against it, to rec even to recognize it. And so what happens? False doctrine makes its way into the church. Why is it that all of these congregations can now start having a traditional service and a contemporary service and in the contemporary one they're going to bring the musical instruments in and others just forget about the traditional let's bring the instrument in we'll have instrumental music why because brethren have filled themselves with fluff and nothingness instead of the word of god Amen. if they knew the word of god they wouldn't stand for it but it's simply accepted. Why? Because they have filled their lives with junk food. Sermons, instead of being filled with God's Word, filled with moralistic stories, how to win friends and influence people, the Norman Vincent Peelism type of sermons, where there's no real depth of meaning, no true understanding of God's Word given because God's Word isn't even used. True story of an individual who, or a congregation who is looking for a preacher to hold a gospel meeting for them. Man's name was suggested. And the uh, some men in the congregation said, no, we don't want him. He preaches too much Bible. They have filled their lives with so much fluff that they don't even want God's Word anymore. Now, isn't that what Paul told Timothy and warned him about and told him to preach the Word? Why? Because there's going to come a time when they're going to want their ears tickled. They're going to want this fluff and nothingness of preaching so that they can eat on spiritual junk food instead of God's Word. So you make sure you continue to preach the Word when it's popular, when it's not popular, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. But that's not what is wanted by most brethren today. They would rather fill their lives spiritually with junk food. And so Jesus is encouraging them. You need to look at that spiritual aspect. You need to eat the words of Christ. Look at verse 63 in our text in John 6. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. Quickeneth very simply means to be made alive. It is the Spirit that makes us alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. But notice, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If you want to have true life, you're going to have to go to that spiritual nourishment, which is God's Word. But when we're talking about the words of Christ, and eating those words, digesting it, making sure we understand it, it we're dealing with those words that are authorized by Jesus, those things that Jesus authorizes within His Word. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, as Jesus is giving that great commission to His apostles, He tells them to go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he tells them, Lo, I'll be with you all the way, even to the end of the world. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. You know, it almost, it, it baffles me that we have some in the Lord's church, and I don't know if it was popular before this, but Dan Billingsley became a popular advocate of the idea that the words of Jesus, all of those things are Old Testament. And what he taught doesn't have application to us today. Well, why were the apostles told to teach people that they were making disciples of all things that Jesus commanded? In other words, you don't teach them anything because Jesus' words don't apply to them today because they're Old Testament doctrine. Why are you teaching them? Well, you teach them everything that I have commanded, all of those things that are authorized within the Word of God. That's what you need to be teaching them. John, the 12th chapter, verse 48 through 50. Jesus says that he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken to myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. We're going to be judged by the words of Christ that which Christ has authorized within His Word. Isn't it important if we're going to stand before God and be judged by the words of Christ to know, to study, to digest those very words that are going to judge us on the last day so that we will know whether or not we meet that standard of His Word? And yet we so many times turn away from that Word to turn to the philosophies of man and the thoughts of man and stay away from God's Word. It's that Word that Jesus gave to the apostles by the agency of the Holy Spirit, John 14, verse 26, that the Comforter, of which, the Fa which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, here's the Holy Spirit going to be sent to you apostles. And by the way, that's to the apostles, not to us in that context. It has no reference to us. He's going to be sent to you apostles, and he's going to bring everything that I have taught you to your remembrance. Why? Because the words of Christ are that which provide the proper spiritual nourishment for our souls. No wonder Peter, as he would end his writing in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, would say, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in that knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so truly, Jesus is that source of life. He is the one who gives life, and He is the one who sustains life. It's His words that do so. Truly, He is thus that bread of life. But also, in talking about the bread of life, we see satisfaction that's given. Because that bread of life satisfies the soul, the spiritual part of man. John, as he would conclude his letter, giving really the purpose of the letter in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, states that many other signs did Jesus, which are not written, or in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. You see, Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. I'm the one who gives true life. 
And if you wanted really to just study in the book of John a little bit more, you could look at John 10 and verse 10, that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus provides within this life, here, now, the true life that we need to live. Truly as Solomon learned that the whole of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. That provides the true nourishment that satisfies the soul. It gives life now, but also eternal life. John 3 and verse 16, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we have life now and life to come. It satisfies the soul. In 2 Peter, the first chapter, in verse 3 and verse 4, Peter would say, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, we could stop there and just go back to according his, to his divine power. That is, God the Father gave to Jesus the Son a word. Jesus gave that same word to his apostles, John 17, verses 8, 14, and 18. By the Holy Spirit, John 14, 25, and 26, and John 16, 12, and 13. There's that word that Jesus set forth that is the bread of life. And now then, that's that divine power He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. If we want to know how to live and have successful lives, you have to go to that Word of God. And He says this will also provide godliness, the Word of God. Piety within life. How that we can live a respectful life before God. How does it come? Through the knowledge. How does that knowledge come? Again, it comes by studying God's Word, feeding on that spiritual nourishment that God has provided for us. Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, by what? That Word that God the Father has provided to us through the Son and through that word being given to his apostles by the Holy Spirit, and they speaking it, they writing it down for us, so that we can go to that word of life that, and study it, and learn life and godliness. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. We can be likened to our God, godly. We can see God's nature, His characteristics, and we can conform our attitudes and our lives, our thinking, our speech, everything about ourselves. We can conform it to that likeness of God, being a partaker of His divine nature. And in doing so, we escape the corruption that's in this world through lust. Here is everything that we need. No wonder Paul would say in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for our doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now notice the results that the man of God might be perfect, completely or thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There are no good works that are not provided for us within the Scriptures. And when we use the Scriptures in the proper way for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, I personally believe that that deals with a proving of what is right and wrong, proving it over and over. How do I know whether something is right or wrong today? I go to the Scriptures and I see the principles that are found therein. And I can apply those Scriptures to that action. And I can thus determine whether that action is right or wrong. That's reproof. Then correction. When someone goes astray, to bring them back to the truth. And then for instruction in righteousness. That's using God's Word in the way in which God expects us to use it. And then... That bread of life leads to eternal life. 
Notice what Jesus says in our text in John 6 and verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Here's that individual who feeds on that proper spiritual nourishment. What is it? It leads to eternal life for him. Notice again in 2 Peter 1. We read verses 3 and 4 just a moment ago. And after talking about being a partaker of the divine nature by going to the words of God, he then talks about adding the Christian graces to our life. But notice in verse 10 and verse 11 then when he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, what thing? You become a partaker of the divine nature. You feed properly upon the word of God that he has provided for us. If you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But sadly, just as the Israelites of old were not satisfied with the manna that God gave them, look at Numbers 11th chapter and verse 6, when they were saying, But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. You could repeat that several times. And so finally God gave them quail to eat. We would see in Numbers 11 and verse 31. Just like the Israel owed, though, that they were not satisfied that with that manna that God gave them, people today are not satisfied with the Word of God. They're not satisfied with the terms that God has set forth as to enter into the church. They're not satisfied with the worship of the church. They're not satisfied with the organization that God established within the church. They're not satisfied with the morality that God demands of those who are His followers. They're not satisfied with spiritual matters. So that what do they do? They turn to the physical matters that they shouldn't be turning to. Because they're not satisfied with the manna of God. But then, well, repulsion. Now that one might seem a little bit odd. But I think it's important because in this, what you see almost is Jesus driving people away from him. Look well, at some of the statements found starting in verse 26 and going through verse 66. That ye also have seen me and believe not. Notice it says that the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Jesus recognized they weren't too happy with him. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, he says. And then he says, the bread that I give is my flesh. That sounds a whole lot like cannibalism, doesn't it, when he gets to this aspect that except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, ye have no life in you? Hmm. Think of Acts the 10th chapter in Peter and his attitude when God says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, no, Lord, no way. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. But now then Jesus is saying, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to have life? How would that not drive them away? It's, how would it not be repulsive to them? My flesh is meat, and, my, uh, flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. But then at the end, we also see Jesus recognize the effect when he says, he asks him, Doth this offend you? Why wouldn't it? Jesus, this isn't the only time Jesus seems to drive people away. A certain scribe comes to him, I'll follow thee wheresoever thou goest. Matthew, the 8th chapter, verse 19 through 22. Jesus says, Foxes have, the ho have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. 
Another one comes to him, Lord, let me go bury my father. Let the dead bury their dead. Follow me. Or when a Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus and wants him to heal her daughter. Mark the 7th chapter, verse 26 through verse 29. And he says, Little children first need to be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it on the dogs. What if you had been in her, sh in her shoes and Jesus has just called you a dog? Wouldn't be very happy with him, would you? But she stayed and her daughter was healed. Look what he says in Revelation, the third, the third chapter, the, to the church at Laodicea. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm, you're sickening unto me. The point is, when we're talking about this, is that Jesus demands that we as his followers be totally dedicated and consecrated to him. One of the great problems that we see within the Lord's church is the double-minded man who wants to be a Christian, wants to go to heaven, but he's not willing to do that which God says in order to get there. They're a double-minded man, and James says double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James 1 and verse 8. Jesus says no man can serve two masters, and yet that's what so many within the Lord's church are trying to do today. Serve two masters. They want to serve and hang on to the world and still go to heaven, and you can't be done. And Jesus says, you're a problem. You need to make a decision. Either get on board or get out. Because just hanging around causes more problems for the Lord's church than it does solutions. We have a need, Jesus taught in John the 14th, or Luke the 14th chapter, to count the cost. Are we willing, really, to count the cost? to serve God in all that that means, to truly be a Christian in all that that means. If not, get out. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. That's what we learn, one of the principles that we learn in this text, that I am the bread of life. Notice the definite article, though. I am the bread of life. Not just one. Among many, he is the only one who can give life, both in this world and in the world to come. Let's make sure that we serve him.